centuries, the people of Nicaragua have passed down legends of an unholy monster that roams the countryside attacking people and drinking their blood. Scientists have always dismissed this creature as myth, like Bigfoot, Yeti, or Chupacabra. But in 1982, sightings of a fearsome humanoid beast have increased, forcing villagers to flee in terror and report excruciating deaths at the hands of this monster. Is this the vengeful work of angry gods? Or the depraved creation of insane men? When an abandoned industrial building is cleared for demolition, a locked door is discovered in its basement. The door conceals an archive of strange and disturbing specimens, recordings, photos, and documentary films. Compelling evidence of monstrous creatures and preternatural events. The documentarian's whereabouts remain unknown. In his records, he identifies himself only as the Teller. His investigations reveal a frightening world of dark secrets. I'm often sent photographs claiming to be proof of cryptozoological creatures. They are rarely authentic. But I've recently acquired a box of photos from Nicaragua that cannot be ignored. They are dated 1982 and tell a chilling story of a dry, miserable time in the villages of the central highlands of the country. The government is rationing water and crops are failing. Poverty and suffering are rampant as the war between the communist Sandinistas and the U.S.-backed Congress rages on. I have found that often during such periods of strife, unnatural evils break out of the shadows. In the wee hours of May 17th, a dozen ragged silhouettes shambled into Matagalpa City. They are refugees from a campesino village, farmers who scratch a living from the hillsides. Father Aldolfo Quadro, a priest at a local seminary, is the one who takes them in. I was awakened by a violent banging on my front door. At first, I thought it was the Sandinistas. But the urgent voices outside included those of women. They were in a terrible state. Exhausted and delirious. They were covered with cuts and bruises from the jungle. They had traveled many miles across rugged terrain with no food or water. I wondered what made them flee in such a hurry. I couldn't fully understand what they were saying, but in time, it became clear. It was a creature that caused them to flee. A beast that mercilessly killed all it saw. Men, women, sleeping children. It breathed pestilence from its lungs. I asked them why they did not shoot it. They looked at me like I was crazy. The people of this region carry a strong belief in talismans, potions, and the power of the ancient gods. According to Father Quadro, some villagers speak of a creature known as Macuana, the angry spirit of a young woman betrayed by the Spanish during colonial times. They fear she has been awakened, perhaps by the presence of foreigners on her soil. Others feel the beast is a proxy of the Nuatl gods, who are known to be cruel and vengeful, drinkers of human blood. Though none of the villagers dared fight the creature, one boy was able to capture images, 
His hastily shot photos are the ones that prompt my investigation. Martino Reyes lived with his family in a tiny village outside Maracalpa. He tells me about a fortunate discovery that led to his remarkable photographs. I was walking through the jungle and I found this abandoned Contra camp. And what I saw was an old backpack. When I pick it up and I open it, it was a camera. And it was like I, I found a treasure. I, I knew I could sell it and bring something to my family that we can really use. On the day of the attack, the first thing the villagers notice is a tortured howling in the distance. The terrifying sound approaches slowly. Martino's cousin Christina is in prison for a drug trafficking offense, but I have no reason to doubt her account of that terrible day. The mountains are full of the sounds of wildlife, but this was something unusual. It caused our chickens and goats to stir restlessly. People began to wake and come out. It was too far away for my family to see, but when it came close, people began to scream. When the shooting begins, Martino's father yells for him to gather his brothers and sisters. trying to catch us, trying to reach us with his arms and and the only thing I could see that it was slow so I thought I could outrun it. So what I did is I, I grabbed the camera and I snapped it. And then with the flash it seemed like to get frozen. <sighs> then my, my, my dad just grabbed me from the from the collar and we started running again. I did look back once but at least thing that I could see is that it fell, but it, it lived again with the spirit within it. These are the photos shot by Martina Reyes that day. I acquired them with a bribe to the Madagalpa Police Department. They show a zombie-like humanoid figure with tribal Nuwaka markings. Its bulging eyes are locked open in an icy stare, and its jaws unhinged. It's little wonder the villagers ran. When an unidentified humanoid invades a farming village in the mountains near Matagalpa, Martino Reyes is able to capture its image on film. His family and neighbors flee while the monster rampages through town. I can't dismiss these reports as simply legend or superstition. People at the north end of town began moving down the road towards us and then past us in the direction of the German plantation. That's when we first saw the beast for ourselves. It was following close behind them. I thought immediately of the snake spirits that inhabit our mountains and ponds. This creature carried that kind of spirit. Like the snake, its eyes were round and unblinking, and its jaw was locked open like a feeding python. His body jerked violently, as if he had some kind of fit, a struggle within. Like the spirit that lived within him was not used to walking on two legs. Christina witnesses a young mother stepping out of her hut with her ten-month-old child in her arms. The beast was right there in front of her. It bellowed out a cloud of death upon her and she instantly fell to the ground. The villagers head north towards Matagalpa city. 
They seek refuge at a coffee plantation, but they are turned away by its owner. The plantation owner fears the villagers are rebels or bandits, not to mention that many in the group are showing signs of contagious disease. With his breath, everything that he spread in the town, the people that smell it, they started bleeding from the mouth and and they died. Y todos los que se acercaron a ayudar. And those who came to their aid would die as well. My mother told us not to go near anyone, whether they looked sick or not. There were fewer than 20 of us left. Half of our village was already gone. The men decided that we would head to Malagalpa city, where they had hospitals and we could get the protection and healing of the church. It was very difficult to tell who had the plague and who had simply fallen because of exhaustion and lack of water. We decided we had to leave behind the ones who were too sick to walk on their own. I will be praying forgiveness for that for the rest of my life. Martino and Christina's testimonies are sincere. And any doubt I have, any suspicion that this might be imagination running wild, is erased by the photos. I believe they are authentic, incontrovertible evidence that something is out there. But what? I study the photos on and off for days. The creature's bugging eyes are reminiscent of Maori tribesmen when they are in a battle frenzy. Could this be something similar? Although the creature's appearance is haunting, its size and anatomy seem unremarkable. Could this be just a man? Perhaps drugged under the influence of tribal mind-altering medicine, like I saw in Haiti and New Guinea. If it is indeed a man, then what is this cloud of pestilence it supposedly breathes? Is it the spirit of the snake? Nothing in the photos show the cloud, but the kid is right on the money with everything else he describes. He never even saw the pictures, he just turned the film over to the police and his account matches the photos to a T. I believe he saw what he said he saw. My careful examination of the pictures finally pays dividends. In the photos, there are thin strands near the creature's head that are not part of the background. They are attached. They look like Electrical wires. A Nicaraguan village has been decimated by a horrible humanoid monster. At first, I consider this as another sighting of a cryptid, such as the Loch Ness Monster, the sea creature first spotted in Scotland in 1933, or Yeti, the abominable snowman, seen periodically in the Himalayas since the 1900s, and Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, the ape-like beast reported in the forests of the Pacific Northwest. In Nicaragua, there are several other legendary monsters that fall into this category, but this case is clearly different. I have the photos authenticated by an associate in Interpol's counterfeit deterrence group. There are three classifications in photo authentication. Vintage means they were printed from the original negative at or near the time that the photos were taken. Original indicates they were printed at some point from the original negative. And contemporary means they were copied by a photographic process from the original. 
Martino's photos are definitely vintage, shot and printed in 1982. The graded photos of the creature show wires embedded in its head, and there may be implants in other parts of its body. If this thing is electronically controlled or commanded, I know it must be the work of either the KGB who backed the Sandinistas, or the CIA who backed the Contras. I managed to track down a former Soviet agent, Jan Gorska, who agrees to be interviewed. He flatly denies any involvement. At the time I was working for SB, that's like a Polish KGB, Polish Secret Service, and I was deployed internationally as an expert in psychological warfare and unconventional weapons. When I heard a rumor about the monster, I knew immediately that's probably the Americans, and they're on a tiny budget like in Nicaragua, so in a situation like this you need to be creative. I believe this man, and refocus my investigation on the CIA. I called in several favors and managed to locate some highly redacted documents related to operations in the Matagalpa area. I make a chilling discovery. One report refers to a D9RCO, the ninth iteration of an experiment with remotely controlled organisms. I find a contact who is willing to talk. I'll call him Gordon. He was a key player in the development of the RCO program. He is terminally ill, tumors all over his body. Maybe that's what's giving him the courage to come clean. Now you do understand that if people hear about this, they're gonna talk about how cruel we were, you know, inhumane. But what they don't understand is we were right in the middle of the Cold War. And at that point, pretty much anything goes. So we ended up having this meeting. This guy that ran the meeting, he was a, a doctor, PhD, MIT kind of guy. Sandinistas were Marxist. They were getting most of their help from the Cubans. And the administration had decided that we couldn't let that happen. We had to make an impact in what was happening there. The violent acts of the ancient gods of Nicaragua cannot match the war crimes being perpetrated in the conflict between the Contras and the Sandinistas. Rape, castration, decapitation. So there is no need, Gordon says, to waste time being polite with their proposals. This guy that ran the meeting, Kelvin Martin, and he pulls out this chart of the uh, nervous system of the human body. And he explains to us how implanting electrodes on specific nerves within the body would allow us remotely to control this person what they did, where they went. For decades, a technique called functional electrical stimulation, or FES, has used electrical current to activate nerves and muscles to help restore function to victims of spinal cord injury, stroke, or other disorders. Scientists have also trained rats to respond to electrical signals from a distant computer command center enabling a human operator to remotely guide the rats through an obstacle course. The goal of these experiments has been to use remote controlled animals to take the place of humans in performing dangerous jobs, such as finding survivors in collapsed buildings or clearing landmines. The CIA version has a different objective. With the delivery vehicle perfected, the team now needs to decide how to weaponize the RCO. We removed the stomach and inserted a canister inside that was filled with a biological agent. We also took out the tongue. The tongue was taken out for two reasons. One, to make sure the person couldn't speak, and two, to allow a tube that was coming from the tank to be accessible from that area so that when we did want to release the gas, we could. The mouth was wired open, the eyes were wired open. Good. The mouth was wired open, the eyes were wired open. And we would just guide these people into either an enemy encampment, a, uh, a village that we were interested in, and on our desired time, we would release this gas, and it would come out in a large cloud. And either people that were close by would immediately 
be affected by it and or down the road because it, the wind would be blowing, that gas cloud would move around. This experiment is brutal. The subjects are unwilling participants and they must experience excruciating pain. I have to find out if this project continues beyond these first hideous tests. The monster of Metagolpa is not a demon or zombie. It is, in fact, a gruesome CIA experiment, creating remote control organisms, RCOs. We just a handful of documents, and uh, I know we were shocked. That was cruel. I mean, I'm not squeamish about things we're doing in the wartime. War is war. But uh, to invent something like that, The RCO, once implanted with its weapons, will be intravenously pumped full of fluids and nutrients. An unfortunate last meal. Then it will be walked into an enemy area where it will constantly seek people out. All the while blasting clouds of powdered botulism from its mouth at even intervals. When the powder reservoir is empty, the RCO will be destroyed. But just to make sure that we could control the environment after we did this, there was two pounds of C4 that was also inside each subject. And on our count, we could explode that, get rid of all the evidence, because this is a war crime, what we're doing. And we want to make sure that none of this would ever come back to us. And that's exactly what we did. Martino and Christina mentioned nothing about hearing an explosion when they left their village that day. It's possible that this RCO's charge failed to detonate. More likely, they just didn't notice it. With a war going on, explosions of grenades, landmines, and artillery shells were common. The RCO is not just an effective killing machine. The inventors also cleverly designed the creature as a tool for psychological warfare. We had one of our SF guys say, you know what, let's, let's paint these guys. Let's paint them like some of the mythical figures within the, in the native belief system there. And we did that. And as a result, not only did they kill the people we wanted dead, but the ones who survived, they ran around telling everybody else what was going on and scared the hell out of them to use the person's unwilling body uh, and put explosives into it. That uh, was really something beyond my imagination. The Cold War gave birth to such strange ideas. In the 60s, we had a plan to assassinate Castro with an exploding cigar. We developed an expensive program to train bees to kill people. The RCO could be written off as just another brief anomaly in history. But during America's war in Afghanistan, this document was intercepted from special operations forces in the field. It contains the words, Penetrate Cave Complex to Neutralize HVT, High Value Target, with D-27 RCO.